Hey, what's up guys? Tugi here, back again with another episode of my Arizona Cardinals Draft of Glory Franchise Mode Series, right here on Madden NFL 19. In today's episode, your 4-1 and one tied for the league lead Cardinals continue on with the 2027 season. There is really nothing else to get to as far as what this team looks like. We're happy, we're healthy. Let's hope it stays that way. We start off this episode against the Minnesota Vikings. We have a four overall point advantage. I am a little bit concerned about the fact that it is not on Thursday prime time. Our clear day of success, for lack of a better term. That is our day. But hopefully, today's our day as well. How do you like that transition, that segue? It's beautiful. Beautifully done. I'm stressed for this episode. I'm nervous for this episode. We need this team to be successful in this episode, and there's no real guarantees that that is going to happen. I mean, this has to be our year. We've talked about it before. Time running out for some of our veteran players, but let's not talk about it in that way. Let's just get down to business. Through the first quarter we go. Vikings get the opening points of this game. They follow it up with a follow-up field goal. Follow-up, follow-up, follow. We get a field goal of our own. It's 10-3. The end of the first 15 minutes. Minnesota makes it 17-3. to Can we get some late points on the board? We can. That is a gigantic, absolutely gigantic momentum changer right there. One hell of a drive at the end. Capped off with an 8-yard touchdown pass to Vincent Wilson. And the outlook for the second half just got a hell of a lot better. We do start off with possession that we ultimately waste. They waste a possession as well. And lucky, lucky, we have ourselves a tie game. 17 all to begin the fourth quarter. Let's see if the Vikings can get anything going. They can. Femi Booker intercepts a pass on our 27, brings it back to the 12, and more than likely the Vikings will score. However, our defense held up in tremendous fashion. We only give up three points. Very, very well done by the defense. Let's hope the offense fares a little bit better. <laughs> Oh my god, 75 yard touch, oh my god, it was Carter Hoffman. What did Carter Hoffman just throw a 75 yard touchdown pass to Marcus Farrell on his first ever pass attempt in the NFL? He did not, he has two touchdowns, Joey McCormick's hurt. Okay, all right. So many different questions. Let's just see what happens with the rest of this game, and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The defense holds on. Vikings force the punt. We're still up by four. 11-11 remaining in regulation. We respond with another touchdown. 31-20. yard touchdown pass to Vincent Wilson. We're up by 11 with just over seven minutes remaining. The Vikings are able to charge down the field, but they only get a field goal out of it. 2.49 remaining. We play this drive correctly. This game is over, and that is exactly what happens. As we're able to run down the clock, we move to 5-1 and one and have potentially secured the best record in the NFL. But the question is, what is the status of Joey McCormick? But even if he's hurt, we might be okay. What the hell happened? You have McCormick, 13 of 26, 125 yards with a touchdown and a pick. From there, Carter Hoffman, our throwaway pick of a quarterback to make sure we had a backup in case something happened, goes 9 for 11, 163 yards, three touchdowns and an interception, averaging nearly 15 yards per attempt. What the hell? Running-wise, the, the ground game wasn't amazing. We're now to Massey, both averaging about three and a half yards per carry. Receiving-wise, Sapp and Wilson getting the job done. Farrell, of course, had the yardage, two touchdowns as well for both he and Wilson. Blocking-wise, not a single sack allowed by the O-line, which is tremendous. Meyer led the way defensively. Quite a few tackles for loss. Big games for Christie and Brooks. Only one sack, though. It was Tremaine Morgan. Kicking-wise, Evan Fain. 
hit the only one that we asked of him, or yeah, the only field goal attempt that we asked of him. Bruce Tootin, by the way, what was that? Only one punt or two? I think it was just two. What the hell was that first game? Again, we pick up a huge win, but what is McCormick's status, and are we better off if he's hurt? I genuinely don't know. He's apparently fine. He was just out for the game, but a 62 overall quarterback threw for three touchdowns against Minnesota. Is that a matter of Minnesota being bad? Probably. But what does that say about Joey McCormick? Pressure's on for our $21 million man. If that is what a 62 overall backup is capable of, as Basman Campbell will take a step up. Of course, he has been relegated to being our fourth string tight end. But he gets a decent amount of upgrades there, the 24-year-old. Unfortunately, that development pattern never really took a step up. In terms of contract negotiations... It's going to be rough. Jamon Hughes and the previously mentioned Basman Campbell. Hughes has had a decent season. Decent season indeed. I mean, if we sign him, there's no way he's staying the full tenure. I'm going to go for Basman Campbell first. And I think, because it was mentioned in the comment section of the last video, what if I just bump that up to seven years? What is his response? Jesus, that actually does work. <laughs> I guess we'll be making use of that soon, won't we? Hopefully it doesn't affect the trade value of those players. We'll talk to Jamon Hughes last. As far as scouting is concerned, I genuinely do not remember where we are. I think we were on wide receivers. And indeed we are. It was a pretty damn strong class up to this point as well. We will not be scouting the seventh round picks for obvious reasons. I gotta be honest again, we looked at the top two quarterbacks I'm tempted to, uh, to scout out Rambo, to sign the other scout. I don't know what this is, but I'll figure that out. And when I when I find out, I'll let you know. Let's uh, let's fire Mr. Not Winters. Let's fire Mr. Barnett here. And I think I'm going to sign Rob Martino. I want to see how good those two quarterbacks are because Joey McCormick is approaching 30. And we risk him dropping off, and I'm not going to say there's a little bit of doubt in my mind over his future with this team, but there's a little bit of doubt in my mind over his future with this team. And I think that's justified at this point after what we just witnessed against the Minnesota Vikings, who were not the best team by any stretch of the imagination, but I mean, goddamn, goddamn, Moose, Moose, he's back again. Good old Moose. Good old Moose. Let's see what we have here. Perhaps the one thing we've been missing, of course, is an elite tight end, especially one who can block. Oh, boy. It's not going to be the best class, however. But the three of them at least aren't terrible. I think we'll take a look at a few more options. The 3-3 three and three Falcons visit the 5-1 and one Cardinals. Are we the top team in the league? We have a game at hand on the 49ers. We are currently neck and neck with the Lions, who again are the reason why we are 5-1. and one. We are still neck and neck with them. They have a better offense and a better defense. But here we are still neck and neck for the best record in the NFL. Let's see if we can keep pace, shall we? We have a two overall point advantage on the Falcons. It was a major come-from-behind victory against the Vikings that even featured a 62 overall quarterback finding success. Let's see what this game has in store for us. They have an elite wide receiver and read clear. But Vincent Wilson having uh, put up better numbers thus far. And we hope, we hope, we hope, as DeMarcus Renaud is listed as the starter right now. I don't know if that's actually true. Regardless, Massey is our power back at the very least. I mean, by far, he's like 20 overall points better in that type of situation. Let's see what happens here. Another home game. Can we make the most of it? Through the first quarter we go. Who will strike first? The answer is Atlanta with the opening 7.7 7 to nothing at the end of the first as we go on to halftime. 10 nothing Atlanta. We respond with a field goal, but a late touchdown for the Falcons. 17-3 at the half. 
And we need a major effort here in the third quarter to get back into this one. And it's not looking too good. Still down by 14 as the fourth quarter begins. And we are immediately intercepted. They'll take over at the 7 and this game is over. 24-3 as we are getting absolutely stomped by the Falcons. Any chance to stay neck and neck with Detroit is out the window as our offense finally shows up. But again... We're still down by two touchdowns. Shout out to Ephraim Fudge. I believe that's uh, who the player was. Atlanta makes it 27-10 with five minutes remaining. Down by 10 with 225 left. They recover an onside kick. That will probably be it. And indeed it is. We couldn't stop the run. We fall for just the second time this season, but it's in extremely disappointing fashion. Especially when you consider the circumstances of Joey McCormick's performance and uh, what happened last week. Brutal. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't great. 24 of 39, 280 yards, one touchdown, one pick. Massey, 13 carries, 35 yards with a touchdown, but the running game was very ineffective. Wilson led the way in terms of receptions and yardage, but the lone touchdown for the rookie, Shamel Lewis. Blocking-wise, the O-line was absolutely decimated. Absolutely decimated. And Darby Clum with 13 tackles, but of course it's never great to see that. Uh, tackles for loss, sacks, they really weren't there today. And that is... <sighs> is incredibly disappointing. Bottom line is, Atlanta was the better team. Both sides of the ball. Atlanta was the much better team that time out. And we will see what awaits us next week in Green Bay. Whether or not we have any injuries or anything like that, we do not. Four and four Packers stand in our way of trying to get back on track. And we will hope we can do, uh, we can do just that. I am going to waste points there on that, uh, that fullback. And well, hey, 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 Nate Barnes went up to first round talent. I like that. And first round projection. I like that a lot. Let's see who else we have here. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. Like I, I just I kind of zone out and waste the points. I didn't even notice that first grade was a D. I'm not too concerned. Again, I'll be able to scout out basically everybody I want to. But uh, yeah, although I don't know if I'm scouting out anybody else there. That's okay. It's gotten to the point where I typically don't have to worry about wasting points. And normally players aren't that bad. But yeah, excuse me for that one. That was... that uh, I should have been paying attention. It should have been Steven Jenkins. You're going to get even worse. But still, it makes sense to sign you. You are looking for much more money than you have any right to want. But I will still look to sign you. We're definitely going to have to make some changes here in terms of trades or just letting people go to make sure that we have the money to sign everybody that we want to. There's a decent chance actually already, seeing as we are past deadline time, that I'm going to lose some of our depth. Which is going to hurt a little bit, but not horribly. We need a big performance out of Joey McCormick. If we do not get it, I think we're switching to a run-first offense. <sighs> we're still dealing with the absence of Jamie as Mack. And you know what? I want to take a look right now. I might take the ball out of McCormick's hands. I might do it. 12th in yardage, 22nd in passing. A passer rating is 40th. I'm taking the ball out of his hands. I'm doing it. Which is shocking to say, seeing what our record is, but I'm, I'm not liking this. I'm not liking this at all. So we're 78 scheme fit on that front. 65 for the spread offense, which I wouldn't want to do. 56 for the vertical power run. Vertical zone run is a 65. I mean, I think it's got to be... I think it's got to be the vertical power run. We're not overly suited for it, but I want to see what happens. And, of course, there has been the debate over whether or not scheme fit means anything if it's just the playbooks, but still, let's see what happens. So we visit Lambo. Let's do this. We desperately need a win. Just to get back on track, we have a four overall point advantage. You would like to think that we could get the job done, but you never know for sure. We're going to give Massey an opportunity to be a lot more successful, try to take the pressure off of McCormick. I mean, almost 2,000 yards, 11 touchdowns, 5 picks. 
maybe it's a bit too reactionary, and if we lose this game, it's on me, more than likely. But I'm just not, not overly impressed. For a 90 overall quarterback, I'm demanding more. And right now, one touchdown, one pick game, after being shown up by a 62 overall quarterback, I'm not happy. But we'll see what we can do here. Through the first quarter we go. Again, in Green Bay, we do get the opening touchdown of the game. The Packers respond, though, with 7-all. The end of the opening, 15. As Green Bay strikes again, now 10 unanswered points. We are able to tie it up, respond with a field goal of our own. 10-all at halftime. Through the third we go. Can we take the lead for the first time in this game? We do. It is 17-10. Green Bay starts the ball on our 13-yard line, though. The beginning of the fourth quarter, and they take advantage. 17 all. 17 to 17. As we are forced to punt. That is not ideal. Green Bay, though, cannot get anything going. We'll start on the 20. Chance here to take advantage. Get something going. That is a beautiful drive. 24-17. McCormick with a six-yard touchdown pass to Rayshon Sapp. 424 remaining. Can the defense hold on? They can, and again, now we will have an opportunity to run down the clock. Can we do so? Yes, we can. Perfect execution down the stretch. And we respond to a very disappointing loss against Atlanta with a decent enough win against Green Bay. It was a little bit closer than I would have preferred, but we are back on track. I'm going to be intrigued to see the stats here as McCormick... Still had himself one hell of a game despite the change. 24 of 40, 257 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Massey with 19 carries for 68 yards and a touchdown. Renaud had a fairly rough game. Uh, Receiving-wise, Rayshon Sapp led the way in terms of receptions and yardage. The other touchdown also belonged to rookie Shamel Lewis. Blocking-wise, not a single sack allowed by the O-line, which is beautiful. Meyer had himself a game defensively. Quite a few tackles for loss. Two sacks on the day and an interception for Darian Meyer. Fain hit the only field goal he was asked to make. Bruce Tootman, five punts, but we were able to make the most of it. We moved to 2-1 and one on the episode, 6-2 and two on the season, as A.J. Ross will hopefully make it up to an 86 overall, making better at run support, and indeed, he moves up to an 86 overall. Zone coverage or man coverage and tackle go up. Zone coverage by one, player recognition by one as well. For the 24-year-old, who we desperately needed when we drafted him, we move forward another week. It's Baltimore in Week 10. And we'll take a look here. Weekly awards. It's not McCormick. It's Meyer for the 11 tackles and the interception. I'm guessing, though, Detroit won again as they look rather beastly. You get it? Because they're Lions. Rayshon Sapp. We'll hopefully make it up to an 80 overall. I mean, making him better blocking-wise would be quite helpful. The question is, how many points is he actually going to get? Making him better as a vertical threat would be smart, but of course he is a converted wide receiver, so his hands are already half decent. The blocking, though, is probably never going to be that good, right? It's never going to be that great. So it's just a matter of whether I want him to outright be a receiving tight end, and maybe we draft a blocker, or if I want to try to maybe bump up the blocking a little bit... You know what? I'm going to go for it. He might not make it to an 80. He did make it to an 80. Okay, do we get decent development? I mean, that's not bad. The blocking goes up to a 47. That might be a bit of a waste, but, you know, maybe not. Because, again, he's not that bad of a receiving threat already. Kind of makes sense to go that way. Uh, Kawan Beatty. Jesus Christ. All these guys want so much money. I'm going to wait until the end of the year. Wait until the end of the year. See what the money situation is. Handle the rest of the re-signings then and there. We will scout maybe one or two more tight ends. Probably not that many, to be honest, because they're looking terrible. If this guy's bad, I'm done. He's okay, but kind of shit. So, yeah, we'll move on. Let's see what we can find on the O-line. Of course, we already have the secondary scouted, so pretty much just the O-line, D-line, and then if we have, well, linebackers as well. And if we have a little bit of time and space left, we'll scout the top running backs, but odds are we're not going to need that. So let's go. There is not a single O-line scout. 
All right, we'll save the O-line for last. Let's sign Kevin Brooks, and we'll focus on the D-line instead. So the O-line, despite it being rather important, we're not going to be able to make the most of the points that are there. But then again, we know we're only going to take top talent anyway, because anybody else just isn't worth having. So let's see. The good thing is, or maybe not the good thing, but there aren't that many defensive linemen that are going to be worth having. I'm not going to waste points on 7th rounders. There's not that many defensive ends in this draft, so it's not going to take us all that long to go through every other spot. We play the 3 and 6, or 3 and 5, not 3 and 6. We play the 3 and 5 Ravens as Jamius Mack has returned. Play Return of the Mack here, <laughs> if you would. Can't. YouTube copyright. Damn shame. Jamius Mack is back. We are tied for the division lead with the 49ers. We are still the third best team in the league and one of four teams, actually in fairness, we're one of four teams tied with a 6-2 and two record alongside Detroit, New England, and San Francisco. So despite a couple of slip-ups, we're still looking okay and on pace to have an opportunity at finishing as the best team in the league this season. We have... A ridiculous seven overall point advantage on the Ravens, which means we're probably going to lose. It's just how the game works. We're going to stay with the old vertical power run setup and see if that really does anything. Again, I have my doubts, but we'll have it set up that way. See what happens. They have JT Owens, who looks like one hell of a receiver. AC McCoy as well. Neck and neck there with Meyer. Meyer's a bit more well-rounded. And Lamar Jackson still leading the way. 17 touchdowns, 4 interceptions on the season. Still best as a scrambler. Let's see what happens here. We're 2-1. and one. Let's hope to avoid that uh, very disappointing 500 mark. Through the first we go. Baltimore gets a touchdown on their opening possession. They follow that up with a field goal on their next. We get a field goal of our own just before the end of the quarter. To halftime we go. Baltimore scores again. 17-3. We respond with a touchdown of our own, 17-10, only for them to immediately drive down the field and get a late field goal, mind you. It's 27-10. Yikes, defense. Yikes. Through the third we go. As the defense is continuing to get steamroll, we do score a touchdown, down by 10, but Baltimore scores again. 34-17, our defense is getting steamrolled right now. And unless we pull off one hell of a comeback, this game is over. We do score on the opening drive of the quarter, though, to make it a 10-point game. We need something from the defense here. Anything, and that is exactly what I was hoping for. A.J. Ross with the pick. We start on the 14, and we only get a field goal. What a disaster. We start on the 14. And only get a field goal. And if Baltimore scores here, we wasted it. We, oh my god, Darian Meyer. Please. Please, 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 please don't blow this. We had such a good chance to put up a touchdown late. And blew it. So now instead of hoping to see this team drive down the field to win the game, now it's just a tie-up. McCormick is intercepted. By Purifoy. And the Cardinals are shooting themselves in the foot. Left, right, and center. Interception, only get a field goal. And... Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <sighs> Alright. Is there another turnover inbounds? Or is that it? 10-point game with 127 left. This one's over. And the doubts over whether or not a 90 overall quarterback is good enough to get the job done still looms overhead. We move to 2-2 two and two on the episode. Our defense gets absolutely shredded by Lamar Jackson. I mean, granted, he did throw two picks. McCormick, just, that's not good enough. It's just not. Rushing-wise, barely any rushing attempts. So there you go. If you thought scheme fit did anything, it doesn't. <laughs> We're now to the touchdown. Uh, Sapp and Mack with a touchdown in his return. But 
I don't really want to talk about any of the stats. I don't really want to. I'm more disappointed in the fact that we could not get any stops and at the end of it literally threw the game away. <sighs> Man. It's just, it's those old tendencies of we're starting to build momentum. Bam. Slip and fall. Pick ourselves back up, dust ourselves off, pick up a little bit of momentum, slip and fall again. It's like anytime we start to build just a little bit of momentum, we somehow manage to screw it up for ourselves. And this season might not be any different, as frustrating as that is. So, uh, boy, this defensive tackle class, holy hell. Can't miss players there. Can't miss. Good lord can't tackle I don't know what to do here I genuinely don't we've found success with the New England playbook this year and now suddenly I mean we're two and two on the season and that's not good enough it really isn't also I still love that they misspelled multiple and haven't fixed it hilarious way to go so Multiple power run scheme. I mean, I just, I don't know if I want to change it up or not, to be honest. Maybe we go to the Saints playbook. Although throwing screens and short passes, I don't know. If, I mean, that might be, might be in McCormick's range. At least a little bit more, right? <laughs> As opposed to trying to throw deep and absolutely blow it. As funny as it is, the Oakland offense might actually be half decent. Especially, of course, if we want to stay on a power run setup. Pittsburgh offense is a possibility. Who else runs a power offense? Uh, Tampa Bay. Eh. Eh, the old vertical offense. I mean, just not really digging it. Wilkes. Eh. I mean, it'd be weird to go back to the Arizona playbook at this point, wouldn't it? Baltimore. Not digging it. Buffalo, no thank you. Uh, let's, let's go for Carolina, maybe. Let's let's go for Carolina. Defensively, I still like the idea of running the New England playbook just for the versatility that it brings and getting a bunch of different people, different looks. But they have had some rough games so far today. And I can't say I have a ton of hope and optimism for them. It's either we go with that or Detroit, really. Which, shocker, considering that's you know the Matt Patricia playbook still. Didn't really factor in the defensive coordinator change. Now did it? Yeah, I might just stick with it. Might just stick. It's, I mean, I mean, we could go with the three-four and then the uh, you know playbook that has the four-four as well, or a three-four and a four-three, whatever else. I'm not totally against it. Here we go with the Pittsburgh defense, Philly defense, Oakland. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, pretty much comes down to New England or whoever else. I'm going to stick with that New England defense for one more game. We'll see what we get. But obviously, we're still waiting for our 90 overall quarterback to play like it. We visit the 2-7 and seven Steelers. We only have a 3 overall point edge. It's a little bit disappointing. I mean, you see their record, and it just, I guess, goes to show that we could very easily be in the exact same situation that they are. We know that we are no longer contending for the top record in the league. That does not, it's not a requirement. I would like this team, of course, to finish with the best record in the league at the very least. The goal is to make the playoffs, as it always is. Whether or not we will, well, we're about to find out, aren't we? Probably. Maybe. Let's do this. Let's see what awaits us this week as we look to once again have a winning record by the end of this game, at least for today's episode. Of course, to the first quarter we go, who will strike first is the answer is apparently nobody wants to. <laughs> Looks like a couple of drives ended just short. Through the second we go, we do pick up the opening points of this game. Pittsburgh responds with a field goal and another one, but a late touchdown will give us the advantage 14-6. So a good time for the offense to show up there. We strike on the opening drive of the second half, 21-6, with 15 minutes remaining in regulation. Let's see what happens here. Pittsburgh 
is unable to capitalize. They are forced to punt. A point here would be great. Spain missed a 58-yarder. Can't really blame them for that. Pittsburgh with a chance to get back into it. They again only come up with a field goal. We're going to need something here. Oh, God, our offense is stalling out. Huge chance here for the Steelers to get back into it. They can do no such thing. Seven and a half minutes left. We start from our own 45. And we at least walk away with a field goal. That should be good enough to win this game. The Steelers march down the field to make it 24-16 with 117 left. We do recover the onside kick. But 44 seconds left for Pittsburgh. They will be starting at their one-yard line. If we're going to blow this, I want to see it happen. If this defense cannot hold on here, I will lose my mind. Play action from Beck. Throw it to the left. McNeil is there on the cutback. Able to stop the clock. They work it out to the 18-yard line. Oh, God. It begins. <laughs> it begins. Oh, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Here's Beck again. Quick throw underneath. And does not find its target. 255 yards in the air. No rushing game for Pittsburgh in this game, but 190 yards on the ground for us. Uncharacteristic with our running game this year, but perhaps the change to the Carolina offense is to thank for that. 36 seconds left in this game. Here's Beck. Stays in the pocket. Quick throw. Finds Stewart this time. It'll be a few yards shy. Picks up six. And without any timeouts, the Steelers are forced to hurry up. 23 seconds remaining. Third and three. Here's Beck again. Quick throw over the middle. Or is there. Will be tackled inbounds. Wearing number 87 in Pittsburgh. Lofty ambitions. As the Steelers will look to spike it. They'll get it down with seven seconds remaining. Ball on their own 36. And it's Hail Mary time here in Pittsburgh. If any team was going to blow this, I feel like it would be us. We need one stop. Beck throws quickly. It's down on the turf. That should pretty much do it, you'd like to think. One play left. One play left. Two seconds to go. We do it one more time. Is that it? Beck, quick throw. Hits the turf. Arizona holds on. We move to 3-2 and two in this episode. Oh, that was not convincing. But we get the job done. McCormick, 22 of 36, 277 yards with a touchdown and two interceptions. Massey had a career day, though. Two touchdowns. Receiving-wise, uh, Rayshon Sapp led the way in terms of receptions. Mack with yardage. Mack, the only person with the touchdown, of course. The O-line did quite well. Jensen, the only one to allow a sack in this game. Defensively, did quite well. A couple of tackles for loss. Tremaine Morgan might end up being Defensive Player of the Week with three sacks on his own. And Fane, of course, missed the 58-yarder. But all is forgiven. We have a winning record in this episode. We'll see what the standings end up showing. There's a chance, of course, that we're not even going to be in first place in our division as George Christie makes it to an 86. Took him a little bit to get going. Took him a little while to start getting those upgrade points. But at 26 years old, he started to make it, which is pretty nice. 7-3 and three on the season here. 7-3. and three. Is he indeed Defensive Player of the Week? Yes, he is. Way to go, Tremaine Morgan. Well done. What is the standing situation like? We are indeed in first place in the NFC West. The 49ers have slipped up. Going to be a very important game coming up. We are currently... One of four teams tied with a 700%, 700%, I wish, <laughs> with a 70% win percentage. So, right now, New England at 8-2, and two, leading the way, but we're looking okay. We're still up there, towards the top, with the best of the best. Upcoming schedule, we play Seattle here this week. A massive game against San Francisco next week. Then from there, it's Cleveland, Cincy, Philadelphia, 
and San Fran again. Man. That is a rough schedule. We have one more game in this episode. We will play this game against Seattle. We're either going to finish 4-2 and two or 3-3, three and three, which would be a disaster. Meyer makes it to an unreal 90 overall. Technically, though, a 92 with confidence. Absolute monster he is. And Jamius Mack will hopefully make it up to an 83. We'll make him better probably as a slot option. I mean... The deep route running isn't great. Spectacular catch isn't great. He can't jump. He's just all speed. Kind of like to see release be a little bit higher. Ah, oh, man. He is all speed and he has good hands. I don't know how I necessarily want to upgrade him. I think I'm going to go deep threat. See if that gets him up to an 83. It does, which is nice. Awareness, deep route, and release. Perfect. For the 29-year-old, I'm afraid he's going to kind of fall off a cliff midway through next season. Scouting wise, what do we have here today? As we go back to the defensive line, that's right, we were on defensive tackles and they were all looking terrible. I'm just gonna scout this last guy, project to go in the fourth round. He is god awful. We will switch our focus to linebackers before pretty much just focusing on the best of the best for the offensive line as we head down the stretch at the end of the season, which I would prefer not to have to think about right now, as Greg Burris. Mr. Burris, welcome aboard. Although, you know what, since we are since we were there, Nagy, do you have the yes, you do. All right, I think we have to go running back training, right? Especially because it's the most expensive. We just invested in a running back. We're going running back training. And you could argue wide receiver. I mean, yeah, probably wide receiver next over, uh, yeah, definitely wide receiver next, but we're going to do that, and hopefully that will help turn Massey into a true superstar. At least get to, like, prime LeGarrette Blount territory, please. Help us win a damn Super Bowl, would you? Thanks. So back to the linebackers. Oh, boy. Oh boy, it might not be the best class. I already have my concerns. <laughs> all right, we've uh, we've rebounded a little bit. I'm gonna scout basically all of them. We might as well, since there aren't that many. We'll continue to focus on that as we move ahead. Let's do this. We visit the four, five, and one Seattle Seahawks. We have a three overall point advantage. Let's do this. Again, it's either we finish with a 500 record in this episode, or we walk away with a victory. <sighs> finish this episode at 4-2. and two And keep pace with the best in the league. We have had so many opportunities as well to keep pace with the best in the league. The fact that we're not out of the running yet is a little bit surprising. Oh, boy, Derwin James, you're going to be a problem, aren't you? You are going to be a problem, aren't you? As they have a very young and inexperienced quarterback, or at the very least, a uh, non-highly rated one. Let's do this. There we go. It's Jameis Winston, actually. I didn't see the name. I just saw the ratings. It's Jameis Winston. We'll see what he can do. Through the first quarter we go as they start off with a touchdown on the opening drive, because, of course, they do. Those are the only points of the quarter. To halftime we go. Seattle makes it 14 nothing. We do respond with a touchdown of our own. 14-7 at the half. Through the third. Can we get anything going here? Seattle makes it 17-7. And that is the score to start the fourth. Absolutely brutal. We need something better here. Seattle makes it 24-7. And we are screwed. We're screwed. We need a touchdown here. And we do get it, 24-14, but 8-01 remaining. We need a stop. Can we get it? No, we can't. That's ball game. 31-14. And unfortunately, we can't end this episode in, with an optimistic tone. 31-21 is your final. No controversy, just pure disappointment as our defense is shown up by Jameis fucking Winston. My God. McCormick had a... Decent game, 27-38, to 38, three touchdowns and a pick. Massey in the running game, I mean, they were okay, especially in terms of yards per. But, damn, Mack led the way in terms of receiving three touchdowns for Rayshon Sapp. 
Blocking-wise, the O-line wasn't that bad. Clem with some tackles. The defense was okay. Not a single field goal required. It's just frustrating. Very frustrating that our defense couldn't get the job done. Very, very frustrating. We lose to a team that we should not be losing to. And we give San Francisco an opportunity to get back into the division race in this season, in which, in the next episode, five games left before the end of the year, we play them twice. I still can't help but think we have that tendency to try and create a little bit of a sense of optimism, only to just completely throw it away. We play San Fran twice. We play the Cleveland Browns, who have been perennial Super Bowl contenders. This is not an easy road that we're going down to try and be successful here. As Demetrios Brooks hits an 82 overall now at 30 years old. Not too bad. But absolutely brutal. We are one game clear of the 49ers. And... While a playoff spot is likely, at the very least, due to the wild card, it is anything but guaranteed. You look at all the teams with six wins, we could easily find ourselves on the outside looking in. And it's that lack of confidence and knowing that we could still slip up that really, really sucks. It would have been nice to end another episode with a bit of confidence. Today is not that day.